for James Tour. You made it. I Thanks made for it, coming, man. Uh, well, for people that don't, we were just talking about meditation before the show, and I started to get excited. I was like, oh, we got to go live. Let's talk about it on air. You meditate 40 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the afternoon, 20 minutes in the evening. It's powerful stuff. All right, everyone, thank you for coming. Uh, this is Dr. James Tour. Works well, comes out of Rice University. James is one of the pioneering scientists, leading researchers on Earth. I guess dealing with graphene at this point, um, and without abusing your title and rec recognition, like how would you describe yourself? Uh, well, I'm I'm a trained synthetic organic chemist, but uh, we work across all sorts of fields, from materials to medicine to uh, uh, um, electronics, across all of the all of those fields. And the materials go from aerospace materials to biological materials. Uh, nano machines, uh, uh, nano cars. Uh, so we we build them all. So when you say synthetic organic chemist, does that mean you work both with synthetics and organics? No, it means that uh, in when 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 we say organics, we just mean the the chemistry of carbon predominantly. So it's so it's the chemistry of carbon, and uh, we learn how to we we put carbon carbon molecules together and. Uh, uh, all of nature is made out of carbon molecules. So we build a lot of natural products with synthetically or we'll take naturally occurring compounds and modify their structure. Okay. So I, I mean, honestly, there's, I feel like there's 80 things we could talk about and we could probably go for 20 minutes on each of them. Um, but I, I think the best thing to do would just be to start from the top. You I have a slide that you've, you've, uh, yeah, offered. start from the top. Let's so from, sorry, we're getting an intro. Yeah. So these go yeah. for it. Okay. Talk, so, talk so, me through so, this. These are your companies. Okay, so this just give people a kind of a, a, a background on the things that I've done. Uh, uh, this is a list of the companies, the 14 companies that I've started. Um, and uh, uh, 15 were, is just a, some of the other ones that we're building on. One is, is dots, making graphene quantum dots, and also CO2 capture. We take waste plastic and turn it into a material that captures carbon dioxide. So you take one problem and solve another. We bit is silicon oxide memory. Uh, that's the one and two are public companies now. Zeta Energy is a battery company here in Houston. Neurocords is for healing up spinal cords in in uh, right now in animals, but hopefully in people someday. Nano robotics is where we take little nano machines and have them drill into cells and kill those cells. Uh, Zariant is uh, pancreatic cancer uh, treatment. Uh, that that's moving into uh, phased clinical trials now. LIGC uh, laser induced graphene uh, and and uh, uh, Geronox is for treatment of Down syndrome, traumatic brain injury, and stroke. Traumatic brain injury is the number one injury in uh, number one disabling injury in young adults. Uh, stroke is the number one disabling industry, injury in uh, older adults. Roswell is for DNA sequencing. Uh, universal matter. We're going to talk a little bit about more about that today. They're making graphene. It's putting out putting out of business every other graphene company. Uh, FJ processing is is where we take uh, printed circuit boards and we we flash it. We get all the important metals out, uh, the the rare earth metals, the precious metals, and what's left is clean enough for agricultural soil in California. Uh, uh, there are also all the e waste, battery recycling. They they've licensed all of that, so that's an FJ processing. United Standard Materials Corp is uh, uh, making instead of graphene, making uh, carbon nanotubes and silicon carbide by flash process and flash hydrogen corp is capturing the hydrogen and using it from the process. And then a couple other companies where we're uh, remediating soil and taking PFAS out of soil. So PFAS is, uh, is per and polyfluorinated alkyl substances. If you haven't heard about that, you're going to hear about it because it's already in your body. It's in everybody's body. It's a pollutant. Uh, it was the forever chemicals. It was used on everything, all the all your carpeting and everything it's been used on, your clothing and, and uh, uh, your food wrappers. And now we're finding out that uh, it's causing a lot of uh, biological problems. So we're dealing with all of that. You go to the next slide. Oh, wait, before we do, uh, number yeah. nine, Rust yeah. Patrol. Yeah, yeah, Rust Patrol. That was something I did with my own hands. I heard about all this... Uh, corrosion in the industry it was a big problem I said, it can't be that bad so developed a corrosion inhibitor i actually went in a lab myself which i hadn't done in many years and and uh and, and about a year later we had a really good uh, uh corrosion inhibitor so you, you can buy that it's on the market All right, let's go to the next slide oh here we go and i'm gonna i'm <laughs> okay. gonna talk through some of these companies at some dirt later in the call oh by the way everyone like the video and uh subscribe and send in super chats we'll be taking super chats near the end for both james and myself 
So here we go. Flash okay, gas so and synthesis. What we learned is you can take any carbon material, any carbon material. So if, if you say, hey, I wanted to work on it. If it's made out of carbon, it works. Put any carbon material between two electrodes, put a high voltage, a high current, and in about 10 milliseconds, it turns into graphene. And it breaks every carbon-carbon bond in there, and the heteroatoms, the, the non-carbon elements, will come sub subliming out. And uh, they reconstruct as the thermodynamically most stable material for carbon, which is graphene. Then you can see little pictures of the graphene on the right, on the far right, is uh, C and D, that's, that's the, the atomic resolution image of graphene. And you say, well, this, this must cost a lot to do this. No, it costs very little for one ton of material. One ton, you put in about $30 worth of electricity. There's no water, no solvents. And so you can take all sorts of things and turn it into graphene. Next slide. I, well, let me ask you a couple of questions. Uh, so yeah. how much cleaner does graphene burn than coal? Well, well, uh, if you made graphene, you wouldn't want to burn it because right now it sells for sixty thousand dollars a ton, and coal is a is a hundred dollars per ton. So, <laughs> you, what you do is you take coal, you flash it, you turn it into graphene, and then the value goes from a hundred dollars to sixty thousand dollars a ton. An absolute worst case scenario: if you did want to burn it, w does it burn cleaner? Uh does it burn cleaner? It it you're gonna. It will burn it. You, you'll still get CO and CO2, but it's still going to blow out CO2. So, uh, um, no, it, I, I wouldn't say that it, it's definitely cleaner than coal, but the heteroatoms, I mean, you won't get mercury in the air and everything because all the mercury has already come out in this process. It sublimes out all the heavy metals sublime out in the process. So in that sense, it's a much cleaner material. As long as you bring it all to CO2, uh, uh you're okay. I but, like uh, here. I look CO2 at... is a, you know, a lot of people don't like CO2. Yeah. I think you can turn it back into graphene by depositing. Yeah. It on yeah. It. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's what we do. We, we, we take graphene and we, we make graphene, then we put it in composites. And when those composites are done with their lifetime, we flash it again, turn the whole thing back into graphene. We've done that with Ford Motor Company. Every Ford has graphene in it since February, 2020. It's in the underhood insulation. It's in the foam cushion seats. Uh, it lightweights the vehicle and it's going into even more. And so we, t one of the big problems is, is cars in Europe uh, come back to the manufacturer after the lifetime of the car. So imagine you're a car company and, and uh, say you're Ford after 35, 40 years, your car's toast and they give it back to you and they say, you can only landfill 5%. What do you do with the rest of it? Well, the big thing was the, the metals you can melt down. what do you do with the plastic? Because the plastics, there's all different types. They're not recyclable. Many of them, they're engineering plastics. They don't recycle their, their thermosets. And so what you do is they're all mixed together. We took 10 pounds of that. Uh, they sent it to us from the stripper lot and we flashed it. We turned it into graphene. We sent it to Ford Detroit. They put it in their new composites. It did everything it was supposed to do, sound absorbing and uh, uh, increasing the modulus. And then, then, uh, um, then we said, send us the composites. They sent us the composites that now have graphene in it. We flashed it, turned it all back into graphene. So it's a wonderful story of this cyclic life of carbon. It goes around and around. Any other asset you bring up from under the ground is going to form carbon dioxide eventually. You bring up oil, you bring up natural gas, you bring up coal. Uh, even if you throw it out as carbon, I mean, plants take it up, they, and then when the plants die, they form CO2. But when you turn it into graphene, it no longer enters the CO2 cycle because microbes don't easily eat this. And that's why we have graphite in the world. If, if microbes could eat graphite, we would have no graphite mines in the world. It would have been eaten. And so this is a great way to fix carbon to make sure it doesn't enter the CO2 cycle again. It, it's, it's just amazing the way it impacts the world. I looked at the way it's being hit with lasers here up top where you see the temperature and it looks like you're pulsing it over the course of 10 milliseconds, like a little pulse, then another pulse, then a third pulse. Uh, and then actually, a slow... what you're doing is, is, is you're confusing two of our technologies. We have something called laser-induced graphene. That's for patterning on a surface. This is just electricity, just voltage and current. That's it. Is it a, is it no a static... Laser. Is it like in no intense? Laser. Does it increase in? Oh, okay. So it, does the voltage increase in intensity? Then three pulses, and then it lowers like slowly the temperature of the. Uh, pulse? You can do it that way. In this particular one, you see that that chart above, uh, where what it does is it it's it's in about three milliseconds. It's already over three thousand Kelvin. That's about twenty eight hundred centigrade in three milliseconds. That's how high it heats very very rapidly just by putting high voltage across the material. 
and you get these local hot spots due to resistance and it just rockets in temperature all the non-carbon elements sublime out and and the the uh the carbon in there will 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 re reconstruct as graphene you can do it with any carbon material as we'll see on some of the, the next slides all right here we go so we started this company called universal matter you see the ceo there john van lewin and the person who invented this people say how'd you think of this i didn't think of it my students thought of this. My, this particular student, Dewey Luang, uh, thought of this. And uh, um, so, so uh, uh, he's the one who developed it in the lab. He's now the, the chief scientific officer of the company. And uh, they're gonna, they'll be announcing one ton production very, very soon, one ton per day. Uh, this, this, is, this is crazy large production rate. This is for graphene. And this is just the pilot plant. This is just the pilot. This is just the demo plant. And then they'll scale after that. So graphene, it, it's going into so many different products. You, 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 if, if you went to universalmatter.com and just you could watch a little video on this and, and, and how it's done. All right. Let's see if I can. Well, let's. Uh, no, let's, no, 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 not now. I'm just yeah, telling yeah. the audience. How, yeah, not now. How did Dewey and maybe I can interview Dewey and ask him this personally. How did he come up with this concept? Yeah. So he read an article in the literature and somebody was putting high voltage across materials and making new new phases of materials. So he wondered, what if I just put graph uh, carbon there? Would, would it would it change? And so he had a capacitor that he put on, on top of a table and two wires and he started putting uh, uh, some some carbon material between it. And and he started noticing graphene was coming out. We have a Raman system, a, a Raman uh, spectro spectrometer, which right away can tell you if you're getting graphene. And then he optimized from there. And now we have big systems with big capacitors and we can do it AC or DC and, uh, uh, and, and just flash the material. But that's how he came up with, but he, he's a very, very creative and sharp guy. I mean, he, he slept in the lab. He had a little bed underneath there. He would just work and sleep and, and go back to work and, soldering and and building i mean just he's a, a student in applied physics got his phd in applied physics all right let's go to the next slide yeah so it's going into all these different products you got concrete you got asphalt road you put 1.1 percent 0.1 percent into cement it will triple you, you i'm sorry you you lose you use one third less concrete one third less. So concrete is 8% of all CO2 emissions for human beings comes by the making of concrete. If you can lower that by a third, it is a substantial amount. And so, so you can do that. If you put 1% in an asphalt road, it will triple the life of the asphalt road. I mean, imagine the energy savings on that. If you could triple the life of an asphalt road. So universal matter has paved whole parking lots with this as demos. Uh, it's going into paints, it's going into wood composites, going in, into metals, plastics, bone composites, lubricants, uh, films, uh, corrosion agents. So it's going into all these different products. And you say, well, you know, are we going to find out this is toxic? Look, graphene has been in our environment already. If you drink whiskey, uh, uh, you, you've you consumed graphene. Uh, uh, these charred barrels have graphene in them. We, we, we bought a bottle of whiskey and did the transmission electron microscopy, and sure enough, there was graphene in there. Uh, uh, graphene shears off of graphite in riverbeds. And uh, so graphene is part of our environment. It is non-toxic. You can drink it. It is non-toxic. People have been drinking it. So, so uh, um, uh, it's something already in our environment. It's something that, that's a naturally occurring material. It's just that it's not available in large volumes like this. And so we're just found ways to make it. So it's a great material in that sense. And like I said, it, it, whatever asset you bring up, uh, it's going to form CO2, except this. Once you turn it into graphene, it stays fixed very, very well. You don't have to stop it forever. Even if you delay it by a hundred years and a hundred years, CO2 won't be our problem. Uh, we'll have other problems with you. Yeah. I have a feeling we'll start pulling the CO2 out of the air and turn it into graphene, begin competing with trees. So we're going well, to have to be very careful. No, no, we've done that. We've turned CO2 into graphene. We have a paper on that. Uh, I'm only concerned that people will create a revolutionary industry and then they end up taking too much out. So we've got to be really careful. Oh, and yeah, yeah, like don't want to take, yeah. The, the tree, trees need, need CO2. Let's go to the next slide. You go to the next slide. So uh, food waste, uh, 30 to 40% of all food is thrown out. Why? Because, because it goes bad. And that's worldwide. And uh, food forms not just CO2, it forms methane on decomposition, which is a seven times worse or many several times worse greenhouse gas than CO2. Uh, you have plastic waste, you have rubber tires, 
flash any of this, it turns it into graphene. Like I said, any carbon material, those are plastic is carbon material, tires are carbon material, food is carbon material. That's why we eat food uh, because it, we're, we're, we're carbon. And so we eat carbon. If we were made out of silicon, we'd be eating sand or something. But uh, uh, um, so, so you flash anything, you could turn it into graphene. It's a great way to deal with human waste. Is it? Oh, wow. That's great. Yeah. Is it uh, feasible yeah. to um, eat graphene? Like and subsist off of it? Uh, no, I don't think. It, no, I don't think you'd be able to subsist off of, off of it because because it 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 wouldn't digest very easily. I mean, it it'd be be. Uh, my guess is it it just wouldn't wouldn't decompose fast enough in your body. It would wouldn't metabolize, so it'd go right through you. There's a guy named Boyan Slat who has the Ocean Cleanup Project. If you haven't heard of him, he's got machines that go out of the ocean and set up these huge tethering systems, and they're catching plastic and recovering it and yeah. bringing it back to shore. There It'll is an flashing. island. There is an island in the Pacific that's bigger than the state of Texas, ten feet thick, and it's all plastic waste. Half of it is plastic bottles and things that have come out of Asia, and the other half is fishnets that that wrap it up. And uh, it's it's just floating out there. And uh, you could turn it into graphene if you wanted to. Could you technically do it while it's in the ocean? Uh, that'd be hard. That'd be hard. That, that, yeah, that'd be really hard because you got salt water and you got to put a current and a voltage through it. So it, it'd have to come out. You could do it on a, you could do it shipboard. Okay. Oh, so yeah. the next slide is the Department of Energy had what's called an Earthshot program. Uh, you've heard of Moonshot. This is Earthshot. And we're not funded by the Department of Energy. We're funded by the Department of, of Defense. But they wanted to make one kilogram of hydrogen for $1 in one decade. Hydrogen, there's only three elements in the periodic table that could be our fuel. That's it. Hydrogen, carbon, or plutonium. Carbon is what we use now. Hydrogen is another one. That's what the sun uses. And, uh, uh, and then plutonium. So take your choice. What, what, do you, what do you want to use as a fuel? Sun, wind, that's not a fuel. That's an energy source. Fuel is something you can put in a bottle and transport it around like that. And uh, um, so we are now found a way to make hydrogen for negative dollars. That means we make money when we make hydrogen. It doesn't cost us anything to make hydrogen. You say, how can that be? We'll show you in the next slide. So what we do is if you look in the top left, that shows you the amount of hydrogen demand that there's going to be. In, in the next, in the next uh, uh, couple of decades, the amount of hydrogen consumed is going to be much larger. So we're going to go to fuel cells. You take hydrogen, you put it in there. You, you can just combust hydrogen. It'll go to water and, and, uh, uh, and you can power things, but you also get heat. But if you put it in, into a fuel cell, you get a lot less heat generation. So your efficiency goes way up and you convert it into electricity. Uh, it used to be made predominantly from, from uh, oil. Now it's predominantly made from natural gas, but soon it's gonna be, be made in, by other methods. You know, waste plastic is a big problem in the world. What we found is that you can take waste plastic, you put it between the two electrodes, you flash it, and it turns into graphene. With the evolution of hydrogen, H2, so the byproduct that comes out of this is actually hydrogen. So here you're taking waste plastic off the street, you're converting it into a building material that can be used in batteries, it can be used in wind turbines, used in, in, in building materials so that you're using less asphalt, less concrete, things are gonna last longer, and you're generating fuel in the process. So this is what we're doing. So you go to the next slide, You'll see, you see, I mean, the, this is, this is just showing that the vast majority of the people material on the top, right, you see these, uh, uh, these bars there, that the tall bar is the hydrogen that comes out versus the other gases. There's a little methane, ethane, and propane, but it's mostly hydrogen gas that comes out. You don't have to separate the plastics. Uh, you know, I don't want to alarm anybody, but, but recycling is really a bunch of nonsense right now, recycling plastic, because human beings have to stand there and separate the seven different types of recyclable plastics. So they, they manually separate it. And then those go, go in and they're washed. For example, high density polyethylene is washed uh, three times with hot water and detergent after it has been manually separated. Then those little flakes fall down these, these transparent tubes and air blows out anything that is not 
high density polyethylene that's falling at, at that rate. So if it's paper or little pieces of metal, those get blown out. Then you take that material and you melt it back down. You, you've got, you've got uh, um, recycled plastic. It costs as much to recycle plastic as it does to make virgin plastic. And recycled plastic can't be used for food or pharmaceuticals. So, so uh, um, we don't have to separate the plastics. We can take them all mixed together. It doesn't matter because we're just turning it all in the graphene. If there's any non-carbon element, that's going to come subliming out because carbon doesn't sublime until about 3,600 Kelvin. Silicon, aluminum, that's all coming out about 2,800 Kelvin. So, so uh, those all separate out. And then the gas that comes out is hydrogen gas. So you can trap that. Now, the, there's much less CO2 emission in our process. It's a very clean process. The bottom line is the cost. If you look on the bottom right, we're negative $4.30 per kilogram, meaning that we make $4.30 per kilogram of hydrogen. Remember, the Department of Energy wanted you to reduce the price to $1 a kilogram. We make it for negative dollars, and that's because we sell the graphene and, we, and you say, well, graphene is so high priced, it's $60,000 a ton. We artificially reduced the graphene price to 1 20th of that, to $3,000 a ton, the price of a typical plastic. And even at that price, that's where we're getting $4.30 per ton. I'm sorry, per kilogram, per kilogram uh, we make on the hydrogen. So it costs us nothing to make fuel. So you take waste, you convert it into a non-toxic material that can be used in building. And in the process, you are making fuel, a clean fuel. And the thing is, right now, most hydrogen is made by steam methane reforming. You take methane plus steam plus a nickel catalyst, and you heat that thing up, and you get carbon dioxide, initially carbon monoxide, and then that's oxidized further up to carbon dioxide, and you get methane. That uh, I'm sorry, you get hydrogen. You get hydrogen. That hydrogen then goes into fuel cells. But the problem is that hydrogen came at the expense of, of, uh, of generating CO2 at the factory. So even though the hydrogen, when you put it in your fuel cell, isn't blowing out any carbon dioxide, it's just converting to water, you blew out the carbon dioxide at the factory. It's just a long tailpipe back to the factory. And uh, um, so that's the problem with it. And so if you say, well, we'll just electrolyze water. Electrolysis of water is over $4 a kilogram. Steam methane reforming is about $1.50 a kilogram. It will never compete even with steam methane reforming, which generates CO2. Yeah, if you use renewable energy to electrolyze water, you're not going to generate CO2 in the process, but it's too costly. At $4.50 or $5 per kilo, it'll never compete. The only way you can compete with steam methane reforming is to have something that's cheaper than steam methane reforming that's clean. This is not only cheaper, it is negative dollars. That's the amazing thing about this. How much does it cost to run the current to produce the hydrogen and the byproduct of the $4.50 of graphene? $30 a ton. And you're talking how many kilograms in a ton? So what's the thousand? Product? So a thousand kilograms in one ton, $30. That's very so yeah, like what yeah. three Metric tenths of a cent or something oh, it's, per, it's, per it's four dollars and fifty nothing. cents but see this four dollars and thirty cents already has that figured in it already has all the Ooh. salaries figured in this is done with a what's called a life cycle assessment you put all those factors in this is what you come out at this is when people talk about the economy and being 33 trillion in debt i think we we really need to focus on our production capacity and the gross domestic product being able to create things and this seems like a solution. This we can re retrofit our entire fuel industry into a hydrogen gasoline hybrid system at first, and then ideally probably just move to hydrogen at some point. And you, you energy you, so cheap, heat, electricity. Yes, you, you what you can do, you can already take natural gas and put about fifteen percent hydrogen in it and dilute the amount of carbon that you're putting in directly. And all the pipes still, and you say, well, you can't transport hydrogen. You can when it's diluted in natural gas like that, but then you can just, you just change the pipes. There's already two pipelines that can ship hydrogen in the U S so it's just a materials change and, and uh, hydrogen can be combusted. So you can combust it or just go to a fuel cell and start running it electrically and you generate electricity. It's much more efficient when you run it in a fuel cell because 
anytime you combust things, you get a lot of heat. So, so that energy isn't using, being used to drive your car. It's just heating things. But if you put it in a fuel cell, you get a lot less heat. So for example, a, an internal combustion engine, a car is 25% efficient in town, about 40% efficient on the highway. A fuel cell is about 80% efficient. And so it, it makes a lot of sense to move to fuel cells. All right, let's go to the next uh, slides. I'll be coming yeah. back to these slides. I have some questions. Oh, yeah. here we go. This and, is, how and this is just, this is how you, you can connect with me. I'm at, 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 uh, uh, tour at drjamestour.org. And my YouTube is, is, uh, uh, drjamestour. So, so that's People how you can connect. Subscribe, with me. So that, follow James. Yeah, yeah. Colloquially known as Jim. What's up, Jim? Yes. Uh, I want to talk about this for a moment, turbostatic graphene, because this is something that yeah. I've, I've been thinking a lot about right here. Yeah. Uh, the carbon materials converted into turbostatic, meaning as far as I know, that means they're like kind of little wafers of it. Uh, maybe no, you could what, define what it that means better. It, it's their disorder. So if you take graphite, if you take graphite and you start pulling apart the layers, you will see the, graph, the graphite has graphene stacked up, but they're AB stacked, meaning that they're not perfectly on top. They're slightly off. And then the next one's a little bit on move and they go back and forth like this. What that does is it optimizes the strength between the different layers. So if you want to just take graphite and exfoliate it, meaning peel apart the layers, you have to put in a lot of energy. With turbostratic graphene, it forms so rapidly, there's no ordering between the layers. That, so turbostratic means that there's no ordering between the layers. The result of that is that when you put it in composites, it comes apart much more easily because if you're ever going to make a nanocomposite, have a an enhancement by adding a nanomaterial, you have to have two things. You have to have a, a, a good dispersion. It has to well mix through the material and you have to have good interfacial interaction, meaning between the host material and the nanomaterial. Good dispersion, good interfacial interaction. When nanomaterials started, first started coming out, people would throw this stuff in and it was like little rocks in there. They never got good dispersion. They never got good interfacial interaction between the host and the nanomaterial. So they never saw any effect of it. But once people started realizing, then once you get these two things done and, and you can design it to do this, depending on the material you want to put it in, then you get the enhancement of the nanomaterial upon the bulk material. So you've got layers of graphene that are easy to crack apart, essentially. Yes. Yes. And then, so what I'm wondering is, are you familiar with twistronic graphene or twistronic yes. in general? Yes. How do you know all about this? I've been following this. This is my life, man. I love okay. graphene. Let me let me pull this slide up here. We're talking about taking the uh, twistronics. So you, you layer graphene on top of other layers of it at a 1.1 degree angle called the yes. magic angle. And then they're finding you can do multiple layers. So can you, while creating the twist, the the this turbo stratus, can you? have it land in 1.1 degrees on top of itself? No, that doesn't mean that we won't be able to at some point, but now, right now it just, it's just randomly oriented. If we, if we could get that magic angle, that would be wonderful. And that's why I'm talking about sacred geometry and metamaterial patterns and shapes. If we can use yes. a frequency to kind of guide the formation of the stratus, maybe we can just create these superconductive long wirings that can hold like conducting capacitative lightning, for instance things like that. Mm -hmm. I'm very excited about it. Yeah, we don't know how to do that. All right. One step at a time. Yes. Um, let's see where else I got. Oh. And so then what, what I would think is like, I'm imagining here, let me, let me pull up this one. Uh, when we would do that, that maybe it would come out in a shape like this layered the, the 64 tetrahedron shows up in sacred geometry, layers of graphene on top of each other that form something that looks like if you're looking through the wire, like the wire uh -huh. would look something like that and just have magnificent, it might even just be six layers, you know, graphene C6 with six uh, little carbons yeah. to create the, the hexagon. Yes. Uh, or it could be 60, maybe it's 60 layers on yeah. the right. Yeah. And it could be like, it could be graphene and boron, for instance, uh, borophene, you know, this this benzene. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, we, we, we've made a lot of different boron compounds using the same process. This process is not for carbon only. We have, we have other methods now. We've used this process to the, the periodic table is our playground. And uh, that paper's up on my website. It's in a preprint form right now, but it's already up. We're using something called Flash Within Flash, and it, it, it opens up the rest of the periodic table. What's, what's that exactly, Flash Within Flash? So what you do, so if you, if you, you need to have the material that you're going you're gonna to heat with a, with a voltage and a current. 
you, it needs to be conductive enough to get the electricity through. And so what we often do is you can add carbon, you can add carbon to it. But if you take carbon with many other materials, you'll form the, say the metal carbide and, and then, then you're toast. You can't make, for example, borophene that way or something. But what happens is if what we do is we take the pure material that we want, we want it to change its morphology. So say from amorphous boron to crystalline boron or something like that, if that's what you were going to do, or from one material to, you take the couple of materials that you want, you put them in an inner tube, and then you put that inside a larger tube that has the carbon on the outside. You flash the carbon, you're turning it into graphene, it's heating to over 3000 Kelvin in a few milliseconds, and then that heat transfers to the inner tube. And then what's in the inner tube is not exposed to the carbon, but it's just exposed to the very high heat. And then boom, it forms the new material. Okay. So it's just, it's just, yeah, it's just a flash within a flash. You put one tube inside another tube. And the other interesting thing about this is that what we're finding is the amount of energy that you need to make graphene or, or any of these materials goes down dramatically when you have a current going through the material, it's not just the heat, it's the current as well. So you, you're using about one third the amount of energy that you would theoretically need to do these reactions because you also have current going through materials, which is a new effect. It's just been known in the last few years that current may affect synthesis, and it really does. Uh, Randall Carlson uh, has been studying what's I think it's called uh, plasma plasmoids technology and the way that plasma seems to enjoy working in a torus. It's its favorite uh, shape to go in. So they take they take these spheres and they pinch them down and up and they create little toruses within a system and the, the plasma just goes wacky. And they're saying they're like reducing uh, reducing pollution, essentially, with these things in carburetors or in engines. I don't want to misrepresent his technology. Um, were you going to say something? That, well, that's interesting. I mean, it, what we're doing is we're not making a plasma. We're actually running a current through it. Plasma would be where you don't have an actual current. You're, you're generating a plasma between the, the, these things. Uh, 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 but we're, we're, we're running a current through. So it's, a, it's a different technology, but I hear you. I mean, uh, we're, we're, we're doing other things with plasmas in my lab. Oh, that's interesting. I'm going to yeah. go back to this earlier slide. I want to look at some of these. I had questions about some of your other companies. Um, I have so many questions about all of these things. Tell me about neurocords, man. I just heard this is like six, seven months ago. I heard like, oh, we're we're healing damaged spinal cords. Yes, that's that's us. That's us. Why, what's if, happening? If you've seen the way we made a YouTube short, it's got like five million views of of a of a little rat that that has its, its spinal cord healed up. And uh, I don't know if you can bring that up, but, but, but I'll, I'll look for it. Yeah, yeah. It, it it's a YouTube short, and in in in. 30 seconds, you see a rat that had, we cut its spinal cord completely in two uh, at the base of the neck, which is C5, the base of the neck, and, and completely in two. And then we put one drop of a 1% solution of graphene nanoribbons in there. And, and what you do is you, you, you bring the two ends of the spinal cord together, you touch them, bring them apart, touch them again. And what happens is that aligns the, the graphene nanoribbons to be uh, uh, in line with, with, with the spinal cord. And then what happens is the neurons always grow from bottom to top and top to bottom, but they normally just miss each other. But here, here that. Yeah, I've got, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to hear this and I, I didn't want to interrupt. So, but continue. Well, I don't know if that's mine. Let me see. With scalp, yeah, that's, which yeah, that's it. Paralyze the rat. Yeah. So that was with graphene nano ribbons, a 1% solution Are you of getting graphene the audio? nano ribbons in another yep. polymer. So you got the spinal cord's been cut in two and now you open it and close it just by that action. It gives you something called sheer flow where these long, thin structures of the graphene nano ribbons will organize longitudinally with that spinal cord. And so they're growing from each side and all of a sudden they now collide and then they heal. That. The first two weeks, the rat was sitting on the bottom of the cage, moving in sort of a scattered sort of way, but the brain was remapping the connections. Once it remapped, it learned which leg was which, and then it could get up and just start walking again. So the hope is that injured spinal cords could be healed with a technology like this. It's not there yet, but that's the hope. But you did it with the rat. Correct. There it is, man. You guys healed. Yeah. 
That's uh, it. That's it. Scored a 19 out of 21 after three weeks. It was running 21 optimal mobility. Scored a 19 out of 21 after three weeks. Three weeks after the surgery, were completely cut into spinal cord. I this is like the the paralyzed are walking again. The deaf can hear again. The blind can see. Yes, I and mean, the poor have the gospel preached to them. We were talking about religion and God and things like that too. And gosh, I mean, the technology is just so phenomenal. I could go on for 18 hours about it, but let's, I mean, what do you, how are you feeling? Do you think, I mean, you think God is real? Absolutely. God is real. God is real. I mean, he's my, he's my, my life. He's my friend. He's my companion. He's my God. I love Jesus Christ. I mean, it's just, uh, uh, he, he, he's, he's everything to me. Does it guide you? Like Nikola Tesla said he would get like downloads of information. Well, you, you know, my, my wife used to say that, that when I was younger, uh, uh, I'd wake up a lot and, and I always had a pad of paper and I'd get these ideas while I was sleeping and, and, and write them down. That happens less now. I, I don't know why that is, but, um, uh, but uh, um, it, it's interesting because there's a guy in the Bible, his name is Bezalel. And God said, I've called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, and in knowledge of all types of craftsmanship. He's the first person in the Bible. This is in Exodus chapter 31. The first person in the Bible, it says that he's been filled with the spirit of God. And the guy was a craftsman. And he could work. God gave him this amazing ability. He could work in gold, in silver, and in bronze. He could work in stone cutting, stone setting. He could work in fabric, wood, perfuming, and he had the ability to teach it. The man was the Renaissance man, and he had this amazing ability. So I pray. I say, Lord, make me like Bezalel. Make me like Bezalel. Give me the creativity of Bezalel. Give my students the creativity of Bezalel. Again and again, I pray. And go figure, God answers prayer. It does. I've been praying for patience. It works. I, yeah. I figured out like in 2007, this is something crazy. I started making internet YouTube videos in 2006. And I was like, I want to carry Jesus's word. I want to spread the gospel. And also the four agreements, which is this ancient Toltec wisdom. Don't take anything personally, you know, always do your best. And like, I started telling my past secrets. I had these things popping in my head. I'm like, what? Well, they were humiliating and embarrassing, but I just told people, I told the internet, the world, and then they stopped coming into my head and I had gained control of my thoughts. So I started thinking words instead of saying them and I can communicate with God with my thoughts. And you'll say, what should I do? You'll think it and you'll get an image of yourself doing something uh, or a word. You'll hear a voice sometimes and you don't even, sometimes you'll start to ask the question and you'll get the answer before you even finish because it knows what you're going to ask it. And, yeah. uh, it's pretty powerful. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I, I have the same thing, but mine is all wrapped around Jesus, this 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 one who came to earth and gave his life for me. And, and I confess my sins to him all the time. And I said, Lord, I'm sorry. So so, yeah, this is what I do. I confess my sins to God and 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 I feel a whole lot better after that. But God proclaims a forgiveness through that. And because Jesus said, look, I, I take I take the, the death that you deserve I take the pain that you deserve and I take it and I'll carry that to the cross. And he did. And then when he rose from the dead, it was a demonstration that he could overcome these things. And so, so yeah, Jesus rose from the dead. And more, the more I study this, the more I see the veracity of the claim that Jesus Christ, the son of God came to this earth. He died, he was buried and he rose again on the third day. Amazing story. It, it's this tremendous love. You know, if, if, any parent knows that they would give their life a hundred times for their child if they could. And so Jesus comes. He doesn't just say, I love you. He says he will demonstrate his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He doesn't say you go and uh, get yourself all cleaned up, you know, fast and pray for a few weeks and don't do anything wrong and then come and see me. He says, no, while you're yet sinners, Christ died for us. He says, Christ died for the ungodly. I thought, okay, this is the faith for me. That Christ died for the ungodly. Godly people got to go get their face somewhere else. But for the ungodly, he gave his life for me. It's, it's a tremendous thing. So yeah, I embrace this, everything of it, everything in the Bible, I embrace it. I get skeptical because I feel like it's Roman propaganda that they were like, okay, the second commandment of the, of the Torah, of the, the 10 commandments is do not worship a false idol, meaning a yeah. person or a th thing, money or a human. And then the Romans are like, the Jews are way too powerful. We need to get them to worship one of their own, make some new thing. And, and Jesus, I don't think he would have been like, I don't think he wanted people to worship me. I like, it doesn't seem like who he would have been. He, he seemed like a, you know, like, I don't know, a friendly dude. 
They're trying yeah. to help themselves. Yeah, and and this is why he was not received by the by the Jewish uh, uh, religious leaders because he didn't come as a great general. Because if he had come as a great general, if he come as as a, as a rich person, how would he relate to the masses of people? So he was born among us. He said, "I'll be born among them." They would relate to them, and then he grew up among us, and he was just had a simple life. That's why I know that I don't have to shave my head and go on a mountain in order to please God, humming all day. I can be a chemist. I can just relate to my people. I can have an ordinary life around my people. And, uh, and and he did this, but this was all prophesied. It wasn't the Romans that thought of this idea. No way. You look at Isaiah 53, which which is Jews. They don't even do it in their normal reading in, 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 in the synagogue. Isaiah 53, the prophecy, it actually starts in Isaiah 52, verse 13, talks about the scourging that he's going to go through. And then in Isaiah 53, how he's going to be hung there. How he's, how he's going to die for our sins. He's going to take upon himself our iniquities. And then it talks about how he was with a rich man in his death, and he took our sins. He took this with him. I mean, Isaiah 53 maps this thing out. So there's many prophecies. You see these sort, same sorts of things in Daniel, even with timing in Daniel, this quote-unquote 70 weeks. The Jews knew that the Messiah was going to come about that time, but Jesus was not fitting in their mind what the description should be. So it wasn't the Romans that thought of this. This was this was already prophesied long before by Isaiah. It was actually prophesied in the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, that, that God was going to come himself and deliver this, that there was going to be an offspring from, from Eve was going to come, and God was going to take care of this. So it it, it, it pre way predated the, the Romans. I believe like self-fulfilling prophecies, if you think you're going to be a baseball player your whole life, you'll work towards that subconsciously. And I, uh -huh. full disclosure, maybe it's offensive to some people to hear, I feel like Mary probably got impregnated by some Roman dude and would have been like, yo, they're going to kill me and him if they find out. So let's tell Jesus's dad is God and tell everyone that. And so Jesus grew up thinking, literally, my father is God. And he would tell people that. And when you communicate with God, you can do it through the visage of a person or a thing. Like you can pray to Jesus to get to God, or you can pray to a loved one and you'll hear their wisdom come back at you. And, oh, and that, that's creative. That's creative. I've never heard that one before, but, uh, um, but it, no, you know, it, it'd be hard to fulfill the number of prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. I mean, he could believe these all these sorts of things, but there were so many prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. And he walked around healing people. I mean, nobody, he, he, he even fulfilled the things that the rabbis said only Messiah would be able to do. Only Messiah would be able to open the eyes of a man born blind, they taught. That's what they taught in the first century. And here comes this guy. And that's why when he healed the guy who was born blind, he says, Look, no one has ever healed a person uh, who's been born blind. Uh, only Messiah would be able to cast cast out a demon from a person that was dumb, a person that was mute, who couldn't speak. Uh, that's what the rabbis taught because they thought that the devil had to, the demon had to identify himself. Uh, but no, Jesus, Jesus uh, healed and cast out the demon from from the 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 man who was mute. Uh, only Messiah would be able to heal a man, a Jewish man with leprosy. Naaman had been healed, but he wasn't Jewish. They, they had pages and pages of how to deal with a with a, with a leper in the Old Testament. There was never a Jewish leper that was healed once the law was complete. Miriam was healed before the law was ever complete, but after that, never a Jewish leper. And what does Jesus do? Boom, Jewish leper after Jewish leper, the guy is healing. And he says, what did he say? He says, you go back and you show yourself to the priest. Let them go through all their little checklists and see that you've been healed. He always sent lepers back to the priest because it wasn't a bona fide healing of leprosy until the priest con confirmed it according to what was written in the book of Leviticus. So all of this was prophesied. So it'd be hard for some, some guy to fake this thing. Uh, what really was he, hard was he, to fake it. What was he doing to heal the lepers? Because it's like a bacteria. Now we know they thought it was some something else back then. But was he like cleaning them with water and like using Reiki? No, no. In in one case, he touched the guy, and another case, he just spoke it. I mean, just like that. Yeah, it's you know, cymatics. in the case in the in the cases where Jesus used spittle, you know, there was a guy blind, and Jesus spit on the mm -hmm. ground and made some mud and and rubbed it on the guy's eyes, and then then he could see. Or, or he put he put uh, spittle in his ears, or he spit in there. He, you know why he did that? Because it is written in the Jewish writings, not the Bible, but the Jewish writings. They said never, never apply spittle 
Never put mud in the eyes when healing. Never apply spittle. Jesus was, was so against the laws of men. He says, the laws of men have made the word of God of no effect. You respect these laws of men more than you respect the word of God. So what does he do in his disdain for that? He does exactly what they said you shouldn't do in order to get a healing. He makes some, puts some spit with some dirt and rubs it in the guy's eye. Boom, the guy's healed. Just like that. You said it couldn't be done. I did exactly what can be done because they're, they're human-made writings he had great disdain for. This he, is why I'm just, just constantly directing them back to the word of God. Yeah, exactly. I'm so resistant yes. to human religion because of yes. this. It's like, that's the word of man. I don't, it's all fake. Like, I don't even trust CNN without references. And how am I going to reference some 2000 year old book that the Romans had their hands all over? Like, it's about God. I hate, yeah. I don't hate, but I, I'm very concerned about the worship of a man. So like, that's yes. why I'm like, Jesus was the shit. I love him. I like him. He was, uh -huh. he's one of my biggest inspirations on earth, but I don't know. I don't know him. I don't even know who he was. I don't even know if yeah. he was real. He probably was you, real. You, you said even even CNN. I, 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 I'm thinking <laughs> the most CNN. I mean, that's not what I'm going to try. But it, that's exactly it. Humans always want power, always looking for human power. And Jesus never sought that. He never sought that. He said, look, I could have my disciples fighting for me. I could bring down a legion of angels here to fight for me. I mean, it's just the opposite with God just the opposite. God is so good. Jesus is so good, so gracious, so loving. I mean, he just poured out himself for us. He taught us how to worship his father. I mean, how, who, who can relate to God? He's in heaven. He made the 10 to the 90th particles of the universe. Who could relate to him? And so what he says is, I'll come. I'll come myself and I'll explain to them what it is to have a relationship with God. You know, I had these, 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 these friends who had uh, tropical fish and, uh, um, it's terrible to have tropical fish. You got, you got to have pH has to be just right, salinity, temperature, light, special rocks, special plants, everything. Beautiful fish, but he could never see them. They'd always swim behind the rocks every time he got close. He says, I wish I could become a fish and explain to them that I mean them no harm. That's exactly what God did. He says, I will come among them and I'll explain that God means you no harm. You can have a relationship with him. Here's how you do it. You don't have to go up on a mountain and shave your head. You can have this relationship with him. And he lived this life and he made the way for us to have that relationship. Jesus Jesus is the best in every way. Dude, I was highly skeptical of God growing up. I was agnostic. And then I saw cosmic microwave background radiation yes. through a radio. Oh, I'm, I'm like, familiar okay, with that, that. Yeah. It looks like a neural net and it looks like your brain. Like there's some fractal semblance and i'm like okay it's real dude and that's what confirmed that the the universe had a beginning that's what confirmed it oh I, you know what i actually think the universe is a torus and that the reason that you see the red shift and it looks like things are getting farther away faster is because the the wavelength is bent it's bending you're, it's curving around on itself so it looks like like if you look at a wavelength like this and then it turns it looks like the length is getting longer so it'll look red it's actually just turning so you're it's wrapping around, coming back through the big crunch, blasting out through another bang around through the crunch again and blasting out. And it's always been the infinity. That is the God is accepting always. Uh -huh. it, it, I, I mean, it clearly had a beginning. The Bible tells us it, it, it had a beginning. And what's amazing is, is that is God is this information. It says, it says in John's gospel, chapter one, in the beginning was the word was the word. Word is information. Word is information is independent of the medium upon which it is, it, it is inscribed. It can be inscribed in all sorts of things. If I have a thought, that's that's the, this is just electronic patterns in, in my brain. And then as I think about it more, you start getting protein synthesis. And as I, after I go to sleep on it and, and wake up, I have now neuron interconnect pathway in my brain for this thought that I had. Now I write it on a piece of paper. Now that information is now on a piece of paper. I type it in my computer. That information is now on SRAM. I hit a button and now it's now it goes into flash memory, a deep trench capacitor in a transistor. And now I upload it to the cloud. It is now in an RF wave. Same information. It's an RF wave and it goes into a box on the wall. From that box, it goes down a wave, down a wire, an electronic wave, into a server farm and gets dumped into another flash memory. Uh, uh, and, and so it's been on all these different mediums, but the word is primary. The medium on which it resides is secondary. This word, it says, this word was in the beginning with God. He was in the beginning with God. It says he was with God and he was God. This word, this information was God. 
And then in verse two, it says, he was in the beginning with God. It gives it a pronoun, gives him a pronoun. He, it's an individual. And in verse 14, it says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the father, full of grace and truth. That word, that information took on human flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, John says. And in his epistle, he even goes further. He says, we held him. We held him. We had Jesus there. We, we beheld him and we held him. We touched him. That word became flesh. That information became flesh. I, that's cymatics, I think. The vibration of the universe is causing matter to form as such and uh, becomes apparent as matter. Or like I think what's happening in the Higgs field, there's this high, it's either a spin or a high frequency vibration that's cracking and appearing as light. And then it's cooling down into matter slowly something like that that's an old that's a, but what i think the, when the, they say the, god's the, a that's man an interesting time see see god doesn't give us all these details of how that happened he just tells us it becomes flesh and this is why on origin of life i keep pushing the details people to sometimes people say why can't you just accept that that god made life i do accept that god made life but i want to know some of the details that he left out of his book and he reveals some of these things to us to to, to say that could be or that couldn't be. But what you're doing is you're trying to put some some explanation behind these things that happen. So it's interesting to see this coming from yeah. you. Like if you're vibrating a tide pool with amino acid and you find the cymatic resonance that will cause the shape to form into a certain pattern and you're pulsing it with all these different vibrations, you may actually be able to guide the formation of life. But yeah, when, I, I, you know, life has so many components, but you can certainly guide the formation of, of things through sounds, through waves, through 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 uh, um, through RF waves. You can certainly guide guide formation of of matter, uh, how the matter is going to arrange itself. You have the matter, but how it's going to arrange itself. When they say that God is a man, I think that's patriarchy. Personally, that the Romans or whoever were like we got to just control these people. Let's say it's a dude and get them all to worship the father. And like these women are like, oh, son of a bitch. Well, I, I'm not sure that the, the Romans particularly liked Jesus or liked Christians. I mean, in, N Nero set Rome on fire just to blame it on the Christians. Tacitus talked about how they were killing all the Christians. He was a Roman senator and how they'd wrap fresh animal skins around them and throw them to wild dogs. Pliny the Younger says he's taking these people who worship Jesus and, and saying he's alive uh, and he's putting them to death. And Trajan, the emperor of Rome, says, yeah, just keep doing that. Uh, if they won't recant such a confession. So, so I'm not sure the Romans really yeah. wanted wanted the Christians around. I shouldn't blame the Romans. It's just the patriarchy. That's that whole God is a man thing. I mean, that's my vibe. I just find it as an energy field, like a vibrating essence. I'm, I'm, I, I, I sense it. I can This subatomic spin, like what's causing this gyration, this gestation of force, I want to find out. Uh -huh. I got to ask you yeah. this specifically. You, I, I, you were saying that you feel or you believe that Jesus's body rose from the dead. And yes. I, what I could think is you're as a material scientist. How? Yes. What the? What the? Like, oh. is it sublimation? What's happening? So, 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 um, it is so much easier to have a resurrection than a de novo synthesis. I mean, people will say life originated and and just started living. I mean, which is easier to do? Origin of life. Or, or or resurrect the dead. Resurrection should be easier than an origin of life. What and was so it? if you're going to if you're going to tell me that matter can come together and form life, that's a much bigger task than 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 raising the dead. Well, and, why do and you so, think? Oh, wait, continue, continue, sir. No, it's, it's so so uh, um, ra raising raising the dead is nothing for God. If you're saying that He can bring matter together and form life. I mean, raising the dead is an easy sort of thing, but this was a demonstration of his power. Nobody, nobody has even taken, nobody's ever made a cell. So you can take a cell, you can deconstruct it and, and, uh, and, and take all the pieces and give it to any group of scientists in the world in their pristine laboratory who say that these things came together and formed life and say, okay, why don't you make that happen in your own laboratory? You have all the pieces. Nobody even knows how to begin to construct this thing. Nobody. But they'll say this thing, it happened in a pond someplace. So if you have a cell that just died, you haven't taken, it just died, bring that thing back to life. We have no idea. We don't even know how to define what it is we just lost. And now you want to bring that thing back to life. That's how far we are from making life. But for God who created life ab initio out of nothing, 
to bring back a life is not a problem at all. And this is exactly what was prophesied. And this is exactly what my Jewish brethren miss because they thought the Messiah, it, they thought a lot of Jews think there's going to be two messiahs, one suffering messiah and one reigning messiah. But what we know is that it's the same guy, the same guy. He came as the suffering messiah. And the next time he comes, he's, he rose from the dead. He's coming back as the reigning messiah. This was all prophesied. So how did God do this? All the molecules were there. He just, just infused it with this thing that we can't even define with life. And it comes back to life again. I'd like to know some of those scientific details. I will. And we might understand some of those in time. I never say that we won't understand because he gave he gives us an overview. He gives us the Reader's Digest version of what he did, but he doesn't give us the details of how these things happen. We didn't know why two parents are tall, the child is going to be tall. We didn't know that until the 1950s when they saw this map in the DNA, this prescription, which is coded in the DNA. And now we know just because we know it doesn't make God any less, it makes them all the more magnanimous that we understand that, oh, that's how the information is retained. It's retained in the structure of the DNA. And that's why two tall parents, it's coded for a tall child because you're matching their DNA. I mean, so 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 one day we'll learn this. But yeah, God brought Jesus back alive. And over and over again, this is one of the most perfect foundational points in history, in antiquity, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. These people talking about it, these people seeing him, over 500 people saw him at one time risen from the dead. And Paul says, you can go ask their names. Most of them were alive to this day. And he goes through all these people that saw him. Hallucinations people can have, but hallucinations are never shared. And here you have 500 people seeing him at one time. He walked on earth for 40 days. He even They thought he was, they were seeing a ghost. He says, no, come here, feel me, touch me. He says, I have flesh and bones as you see I have. Thomas said, I won't believe it unless I stick my finger into the hole in his hands and unless I stick my hand into the hole in his side. Because when Jesus was on a cross, a Roman soldier stabbed him so hard in the side, it opened him up and blood and water gushed out. Why blood and water? The water phase had already separated. So after time, you get a coagulated phase of, of deep red and you get, get uh, an aqueous phase that's just light pink. And this is what came out. He'd been dead for hours already on the cross. And, and, uh, uh, it is into that hole that Thomas says, I won't believe it unless I stick my hand. Is this a man who's trying to believe this? No, he doesn't believe it at all. He thought, you know, some guy with long hair and, 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 and a white, white robe or something must be an imposter. Jesus appears to him. He says, Thomas, come here. Stick your finger into the hole in my hands. Then he tells him, he commands him. The risen Savior commands Thomas to stick his hand into his side. Some people say that he didn't do that. How can you refuse the risen Savior? Thomas is sticking his hand into the hole in Jesus' side. No imposter is walking around with a hole in his side big enough for a man to insert his hand and in inviting people to do it. Jesus ate with them. He met with them in Jerusalem, in Emmaus, and the road between Jerusalem and Emmaus. He met with them indoors and outdoors. He met with them up in the Galilee. He cooked a picnic for them, a fish picnic for them on the beach in Galilee by the seashore. Jesus walked on earth for 40 days doing this. So over and over again in all these sightings, and the amazing thing is these people went to their death saying that Jesus died, Jesus died and rose again, saying that they had seen Jesus. They went to their death saying that Jesus, Jesus had risen from the dead. I would die for what I believe. There's nothing fancy about that. Lots of people would die for what they believe. These people weren't dying for what they believed to be true. They were dying for what they knew to be true because they saw it with their own eyes. And nobody dies for what they know to be a lie. That's These what I'm people about. saw it with their own eyes. And they went to their death. And you look at the description of their death. It's crazy what they were going through. One was flayed alive. Another was boiled in oil. I'll tell you, if they were boiling the oil for this guy, he just said, uh, uh, before I go in there, psych, April Fool's, let me tell you where we, we, we buried the body. No, again and again, he was there. So th this, is, this, is, this is so much evidence for his resurrection. Have you heard of phantom DNA? It's an experiment. I've heard of it. Remind me, remind me what that is. Well, as far as I know, and I don't want to misrepresent this, it's kind of off the cuff. I wasn't planning on talking about this, but I, maybe I should have, uh, that they took DNA in a vacuum and they hit it with photons. And then the photons start to revolve around the DNA and like sort of function with the DNA. And then they remove the DNA and the photons stay there for a set amount of time as if the DNA is still there. 
And I'm wondering if Jesus's spirit was still manifest because of the love and that the people, the adorate people, truly, he was a part of people that he, his embodiment was available to perceive. And especially that, I, I don't know if they were tripping their balls off with like psychoactives and what they were on, or if they were just true meditatively understanding and believing him that he would be there with them perceptually. Well, actually, they were not believing. Even when he appeared to them, they, they the women said, hey, we've seen the risen savior. They're like, oh, come on. You can't be real. I mean, none of them embraced this. They weren't longing to see him. They never thought he would rise from the dead. They never believed it. And he had to show them all these things to try to believe it. So, so in that sense, they were not trying to believe it. They didn't believe it at all. Uh, uh, and until he appeared to them and they touched him and they, they, they ate with him and then they started to believe it. it all of them, it says that, that they didn't believe. It. But the other thing about this, what I find interesting, Ian, is that you, you, you are trying to make sense of some of this scientifically. And this is exactly what science does. This is what we do. People don't understand. They think you go probing around. It's not that I'm trying to discount God. I'm just trying to say, I want to fill in some of the details that he didn't tell us about. And you're trying to fill in some of the details. This, this reminds me of chiral induced spin selectivity, where only, only electrons that have the right spin for that right chirality are going to go down that. And, and uh, the other ones don't even go in because they would backscatter. They'd heat too much. So we're, this, is, this is a new phenomenon in the last 20 years that, that, that has been found. So what, what God does is he gives us more and more insight over time through the sciences onto how he might have done some of these things. Yeah. Science is certainly proving God for me, or at least evidencing like Good. The cosmic microwave background radiation, for instance. With Jesus, I feel like the most likely thing is someone either stole his body or he wasn't really dead. Like, like um, Rasputin was, they tried to kill him. They stabbed him and they shot him or something and then he still was alive because he had that powerful spirit he like very difficult to kill but you're saying that jesus died literally on the cross and they were they were like he is definitely dead the blood uh, so and the water it even separated to no one living through this no one living through this and in fact jesus even says in in revelation chapter one he says i was dead but now i am alive jesus was dead and and in in fact over and over again he was proclaimed to have been dead uh, I, these guys didn't mess around. No one ever comes off a Roman cross alive or else the guys had to go up in his stead. They made sure that everybody was dead. I, uh, it's been an hour, man. And I feel like we hammered the top level of everything that we're about to spend a lifetime on discovering and rediscovering, I think is the right term. Um, do you, I, I think we should maybe, do you have anything else you want to bring up? Well, you, you, you know, Ian, you, you got, you got, uh, you got all of this evidence before you. I mean, you're a delight to talk with. I mean, you really are. You got all this evidence before you, and and you keep coming up with these things that Jesus wasn't quite alive. <laughs> Jesus is very much alive. What I ask you to do is to ask him, ask him, say, Lord, if you are alive, if 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 you are alive, Lord, show me, reveal this to me in some way, reveal this to me. Even if you go to John chapter one. And start reading that very slowly. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the I Word just, was God. I just asked him. He said no, but I think he's sentient. I think he's not alive, but he's sentient. You just asked him, and he said no? Yeah, I mean, it's not a perfect answer, but I heard no. Uh, but I think <laughs> okay. sentience, li life and sentience are different. Like, plasma seems sentient. It's There's some... I don't know if intelligence, the right word, sentient more like, and spirit being, uh -huh. I don't know if it's like a magnet, your magnetic field interacting with my magnetic field and the earth's magnetic field and all these fields interoperating, cooperating are creating uh -huh. spirit. And that has some sort of sentient, like the, the Schumann resonant uh, existence. Uh -huh. I, I, yeah, I need in, better, in, better in, words. Interesting. Do, do me a favor. Re, read chapter one of John, the gospel according to John, very slowly. Do you have a Bible? Do you own one? I, yes, I believe there's one right out here. Yeah. Okay, just read chapter one slowly. Sometime when you get a chance, just read that one chapter. It 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 take you ten minutes, but read it read it slowly, thoughtfully, and and say, Lord, if you're alive, reveal this to me. If you're alive, and just watch that chapter come alive. I I don't. If I could get you to read the New Testament, the New Testament would speak for itself. I mean, if you start reading the New Testament, you're going to come to believe Jesus. I mean, that that book is amazing. It is just amazing.
You start reading the New Testament, you'll come to Jesus. Anyway, I'd be glad to stick around and answer some of your 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 listeners' questions if if you if you'd like. That's a great idea. We have some super chats. People, get your super chats okay. in for James and myself. We're gonna read a few here. Let's uh let's start from the top. We'll bring them up on screen. Oh, here we go. Philip Fisher. Thanks for bringing this guest on. Can't wait to learn more. Well, Philip Fisher is uh one of my business partners, actually. Philip, good to oh. good to hear from you. And I hope you learned more. Uh, I did. Let's take the next one. Wait, 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 you know, you Ian, it's interesting. It's it's no, it's just interesting yeah. that that uh, that that he's he, he's thanking for for my coming on after the last time I was disinvited, dude. I've been uh, yeah, we're trying to have you on IRL and schedule got all out of whack, dude. I've been, I mean, graphene since 2011. I think I've been so excited about it when I learned like, oh, really, we're gonna have like we're gonna be able to make buildings that are also superconductors and capacitors with touchscreen walls and like yes super lightweight we'll be able to have like drone um drone construction and orbit where we're like mass producing huge uh carbon structures we'll be using like laser induced plasma channels to recharge the sun with hydrogen so it doesn't expand too much and like sustain the yeah i'm into it let's let's take the next one grizz locks with the 50 dollars super chat whoa the same week i fall down the james to a rabbit hole he's ian's first guest Technically second, because I had Andreas exert us on last night, and we kind of did a graphene little preempt. That was very fun. But yes, James is absolutely my first official guest. Uh, Divine Providence, I suppose. Ian, sometimes I think your soul is too big for your body, my friend. Love you, man. It's an interesting concept there. Yeah, interesting maybe, concept. Maybe I need to rein it in. Was that you meditate? Yeah, you were telling me before. When you meditate, how do you do it? Or when you pray uh, and meditate? It, what do you it, do? It's always around the word of God. So I'll take a Bible verse and I'll just study it and and just think about it and turn this thing around over and over again and say lord what does this mean that, that that's to me what meditation is i've been doing like no thoughts for long periods of time and then you'll realize you're thinking and you just let it go and then seven seconds will go by and you'll realize oh there's a thought and you just have no thoughts it's pretty nice thank you grizzlocks we got up next rusty shackleford shackleford we need more people like ian thank you existing I, wow. The lack of grammar is exalting. I, I love that. No, but you. but you you you've got some devoted fans. That's great, dude. People really listen. That's one of the values of listening to people is that they start listening to you. You know, I just noticed that about you. You are a very good listener. Mo most of the people who interview me want want to talk and talk and talk and talk. And you just you just let me speak. And if I'm speaking, you don't interrupt me. You're you're an amazing guy. Yeah, I think I followed all of it 100%. There were some terms you were using early on the slideshow presentation that I didn't understand. I didn't know that what they meant, but I can learn that. And I'd like to do this again if you're interested and take it. Yeah, the next yeah, level. we can do it again. Yeah, yeah, big time. Justin Desroches. I like that name. Desroches. Ian, this is great. All 20s today. You, are you familiar with the 20, the, the, the metaphor of your play Dungeons and Dragons? No, I've never played it. You roll a 20 sided die and when you're playing the game. And if you roll a 20, it's a critical success. Okay. So, and if you roll a one, it's a critical failure. Whenever you're trying to accomplish okay. something, it's pretty funny. So, Justin, thank you for the critical success. You rule for firing up your channel. I wanted to learn more about graphing. Well, today you did. Yes. And we're just, dude, and I'm glad. I'm glad when I was in South America in 2018 with the guy I was talking about last night that I did a show with last night, Exertus, who you're going to love. Uh, we went down there to start a graphene company. My friend was pulling plastic out of the ocean. We were like, well, we can break it down with uh, an, and with um, Pestiolopsis microspore, this fungus that eats plastic, converts it into sugar. And Andreas was like, and then we can mix that with graph with carbon to create like a super strong, lightweight building material and 3D print these tubes to create geodesic domes. So we had this plan to do that. But the way we were going to make the graphene was with um, chemical vapor deposition onto a copper strip in a vacuum. You'll never make enough. You'll exactly. Make enough. And it just didn't feel, it felt like, and they were like, how much money are you going to make? And I'm like, I just not, I'm not into it for the money, man. Universal matter would put you out of business really. Exactly. Fast. So I think lasers is absolutely the way to go. I mean, until we find, maybe we can do it with sound in the future, but universal matter is going to be doing it until then. I want to become a part of it or at least publicize the shit out of it. I love it. I'll do the Indian Jesus. So I'm going to do a show with uh, up and coming Ian. I would do anything to chat with you about religion and God. I think we could shift an entire paradigm with one conversation. Let's connect. We are connected and we will connect more. We will reconnect and interconnect. Thank you. The Indian Jesus. Thank you. Who's next? Zippy, De Zippy, De strange. You should have 
the Indian Jesus official on the show. He's a moral atheist that loves tearing into dogmatic thinking anywhere it pops up. Moral atheism. I'm not quite sure how to define that, but that's pretty cool. I mean, I, I think saying that you're an atheist is the same as saying you're a theist, but I guess I'm, I'm saying there is a God. I just don't know if it's a, like, what is a, the theism? I'm not, I don't know if I would call myself a theist because I kind of find it as like a decentralized uh, uh, vagrance or something, this like ever present maneuver. All right. We got another one here from uh, Texas Talk, Talk, Tech Talk, Texas Tech Talk. We mentioned psychedelics a lot, but haven't talked about the benefits of lion's mane enough. Love you, man. Speaking of lion's mane, I have lion's mane extract right here, which I squirt in my mouth from time to time. What, 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 where does it's it come a, from? It's a mushroom, lion's mane mushroom. Oh, and oh, I, uh, I haven't gone too deep into the benefits, but uh, I've read that there are a lot of them. Do you ever study with psychedelics when you guys do chemistry or like physiology and stuff? Is that become part never part of ever ever never never you, you know uh um no i don't I, I don't even drink alcohol yeah psychoactive that was part of how i don't want to like say that it was the psychedelics that got me to believe in god but i was pretty hardcore like if i if there's no proof i'm not going to believe it and then i started after smoking pot uh i started to feel energy more i could feel the heat like i could sense the heat coming out of my skin and i started working the reiki and i had some psilocybin and kind of saw like the differential between life and non-life it became very apparent the living matter is like so amoebic it's like i mean it's stark and that's helped me kind of kind well, of this, this whole proof or not proof i mean that's it's a good thing i mean the new testament is full of proof i mean it's a document of evidence that's what people don't understand they think that it's some kind of blind faith. It is not. It is a faith based on historical facts over and over and over again. And the more we research it, the more historical facts. That we, so this is not a blind faith at all. So I agree with you there. Well, you're of Jewish descent uh, culturally. Yes, yes. Were I was born and raised a Jew. I, I'm still am a Jew. I would die a Jew. I'm still, I just believe Jesus is the Messiah, just like all the apostles. They were all Jewish. Oh, cool. Yeah, I love that yeah. Jesus was Jewish. He's trying to, he's like reforming Judaism. Yeah, Jesus Jesus was Jewish. I mean, when I was a kid, the, the, the rabbis told us that Jesus was Christian. They didn't want us to know that he was a Jew. Who knew? I didn't know. And uh, <laughs> I'm a big fan. Yeah. Uh, I think we got another one here from Keith. What's up, Keith? Does graphene occur naturally like Buckminster Fullerene Buckyballs does in soot? Or is it structurally created by moving a current through it? No, it's an it, it, all of graphite is is an agglomeration of graphene layers. So so uh, uh, and then there's also graph graphene in coal. We had a paper uh, maybe 20, 2015 or something. I think it was 2014, 2013, where we took coal and I, I remember it was in my office, sitting right at this table in my office. I was with a bunch of students and I said, here's a piece of coal. I'll bet in coal, there's little pieces of graphene that haven't yet gotten bigger and bigger to turn this thing into graphite. I bet it's it's little pieces of graphene interlinked with hydrocarbon chains. And I looked around at my students and I said, which one of you will go in and take this and put it in nitric and sulfuric acid? It'll chop up, it'll oxidize all the aliphatic, and we should get little pieces of graphene. And the older students just kind of smirked and laughed, thought it was a crazy idea. There was one brand new graduate student. I said, here, your job, go do this. He went and he did it. Boom. It opened up the whole flask filled with this fluorescent material. And it was all what was called graphene quantum dots. Inside coal is these locked, these little graphene quantum dots. And that was the origin of what is now the public company dots. Yeah. I have that right here, actually. Let me pull that up. Oh, not that one. Uh, this one here, that was the first company, I think in the slideshow. Yes. In the slideshow. That was the first one. Wait a minute. Here we go. Come, come down. Where are we at here? Uh, oh my gosh. This is the first moment of dead air that we, oh, sorry about that. I had you removed. I'm still getting familiar with the, uh, the tech everyone. So thanks for bearing with me. Here we go. The, uh, quantum dots. So are, are, yeah. is this, does this mean that the graphene has surface area, but no core? That, that means, so it's just very small. There can be two nanometers, three nanometers. They could be 70 nanometers and every one fluoresces differently. Some fluoresce red, some fluoresce blue, uh, and everything in between based on the size of the quantum dot, based Is on the like, size of the graphene. Can you actually produce one hexagon of graphene? 
or does one it need like on a graph that would be a benzene ring yes you can buy a whole bottle of it it's called benzene are they less <laughs> functional than six it's a solid it's a, it's a, it's a, it's it used to be a common solvent now now they don't use it as a solvent anymore because what happens is your body oxidizes it up to benzene epoxide and then it reacts with n7 guanine the 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 n7 on guanine on your dna and it functionalizes the dna which most people don't like to do oh what does that mean to functionalize it uh you've modified your dna and uh, you, it's it's going to give you cancer. And so you, thankfully, we have little enzymes that run up and down and, and kind of pull those things out. But if ever they get left, it's, it's, it's a site for a modification in, in your genome. And I heard uh, that I just, sorry, oh, yeah. um, the Go East ahead. Palestine burn off when they burned all those chemicals uh, that benzene was being released into the air. Is it absolutely where, can we like hit it with a laser to create graphene out of benzene and just have it fall as particles? No, that it's 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 kind of too dilute in the air at that point. I mean, all you can do is just let it dissipate at that point. Um, you know, we we when I was an undergraduate, we used to use benzene in the laboratory, and then after that, uh, they they took it out of the lab and they said this is too carcinogenic. It used to be a very common solvent, but that's just one hexagon, and it's hydrogens coming off all the ends because you got you have you have to fill the other vacancy. So yeah, that that's benzene, and you can buy a whole bottle of it. We got bottles of it in the lab. Oh, so benzene is six hydrogens? Six All hydrogens. Together. Six what carbons, it's... six hydrogens. Oh, it could be either or or. No, it is six carbons and six hydrogens. C6 Thank you for H6. the... I appreciate the, the de facto chemistry lesson as well. This yes. is helping me quite a yeah. bit. Yeah, uh, that, 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 that's kind of what I do for a living. That one I'm, is easy to answer. Man, you are the, uh, you are the teacher. I am the student. I think we have... Ooh. We have this one. We talked about the Buck, Mr. Fleury. Yeah, Bucky. Well, no, Bucky. I never answered this. All right. On. So does graphene occur naturally like Buck, Mr. Fleury? Yeah. So, so yeah, it, it answers, it has it in coal. And like I said, as individual layers or as very few layers, coal shears off. I, I mean, graphite shears off in riverbeds and it's floating around. And you can see near single layers, even from, from these charred barrels of whiskey. Uh, you run a TEM, you see these little flakes of uh, graphene. Yeah, so it does occur naturally. Yeah, it's a, it's a natural, uh, naturally occurring material. Thank you, Keith, for that awesome question. And then uh, Texas Tack Talk. I think we we uh, oh grow your own lion's mane, heal your brain. There's studies showing recovery of damaged brain cells. That's excellent, excellently fascinating. Wow. I didn't know that. That's our final super chat for the day, Jim Tour, Mister Mad Dude. Thanks for coming out, brother. <laughs> oh, this has been fun. This has yeah. been fun. You're, you're you're a great interviewer. You listen. Oh. Thanks, man. And you're one of the most fascinating scientists on earth, in my opinion, at the moment. So I really appreciate the time. Uh, ladies so and gentlemen. Much, yeah, absolutely. I'm going to throw up James, uh, your, your data again, so people can follow you all over social media. They're going to be following your work. Yeah. Down with the my YouTube channel, DR James tour, go there, see me there. And, uh, um, yeah, yeah, you can, you, you can see that check out my YouTube channel and, um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll post this video up there too. We'll, we'll cross fertilize because I'm, I'm sure my audience is probably a little bit different than your, your audience. Excellent. That's how we do it. That's synergy in action. Ladies and yes. gentlemen, like the video, subscribe to the channel. We'll be doing a lot more of these. Stay tuned and we'll see you later.